Welcome to the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. My name is Natalie Nidham. I'm a nutritionist, a human potential, and epigenetic coach, and I created this podcast to bring you the latest ways to take control of your health and longevity. We cover it all, from new technology to ancestral health practices, personalized interventions, and a very special interest of mine, peptides. Enjoy the show. Welcome back, guys. Uh, we've got a really great episode for you today. Let me ask you a question before I go launch into anything. Do you wear glasses? Do you wear glasses so that you can see things from far, far away? What were you? Why were you told that you had to wear glasses at some point in your life? Were you told that it was some kind of a weird genetic disease? I mean, defect, or possibly that it's just... Um, a medical condition that nobody really knows why it happens and you were going to have to be wearing these glasses. And then a couple of years or months later, you went back to the optometrist and, oh, your vision has slipped. You need a better pair of glasses. And then again and again until someday it mysteriously stabilized. Well, today's guest is here to talk to us about this whole business of the eyeglass industry and how myopia, which is what we're talking about here, when you can't see things from far, is actually more of a refractive state. That means that it is affect, It is a condition that is affected by an individual's environment and vision habits rather than one of these mysterious disease states. Um, he's kind of turned this whole notion on its head. And just so you know, there's nothing to buy here. I mean, you can do his program to help to reclaim your vision, but he's not selling vitamins. He's not selling any kind of supplements or exercises. He has a seven-step process that he himself discovered through arduous research that he did when he decided he was going to fix his vision because this guy was wearing the you know bottom of the bottle thick kind of eyeglasses. And today he wears no eyeglasses whatsoever. He has reclaimed his 2020 vision. So he's not making any promises to anybody. He's not saying you will absolutely get to throw away your glasses, but he has legions of fans, thousands of people, many, if not all, who have at least improved their vision and many who have reclaimed their 2020 vision. So his name is Jake Steiner. Really interesting cat, um, definitely um, is out to expose the sales strategy and the glasses trap. So he talks about the glasses industry and the lenses as really, really, really big business that is ultimately driving this story that we're all being fed. So Jake Steiner is great speaker. I hope, uh, I think you're going to enjoy, I really enjoyed speaking with him and uh, you can find him and connect with him in a variety of places, starting with Facebook. He has a group called End Myopia. He has a great YouTube channel, End Myopia again. And of course, he has a website, endmyopia.org, which is where you can find a ton of the research that he has published, um, just that he's gathered as well as links to join his program if that's something that moves you. So um, we're going to bust some myths here today. So I hope that you enjoy this as much as I enjoyed speaking with Jake. If you get value from this podcast, by all means, please share it with your friends, your family, anybody who you think will get value from it as well. And of course, please leave us reviews because it's those reviews that allow us to rise up the rankings and get more amazing guests for you guys. If you're looking to connect with me, you can find me through my website, natnidham.com, or you can find me on Facebook in the Optimizing Superhuman Performance Group or on MeWe in the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Group. You can also find me on Clubhouse. If you're a Clubhouse person, I'm very often in a room at 8.30 in the mornings on most weekdays, and then in various rooms here and there. And of course, on Instagram, just at Natalie Nitto. So thank you so much for joining me again today. Enjoy the episode. And by all means, let me know what you think. Hey, folks, before we launch into the episode, just one thing. We have a sponsor drinkhrw.com. 
my, this sponsor is all about the magic of molecular hydrogen, and they make the most incredible molecular hydrogen products. They make molecular hydrogen tablets that you can easily just drop into your water every morning as you start your day. They actually even have flavored ones in raspberry flavor, if that's your jam. I like mine uh, plain with a squeeze of lemon, but I also love the raspberry. They even have tablets that you can drop into your bath bathtub to soak to get a whole body treatment of molecular hydrogen and tablets you can drop into a bowl of water and apply to your face. And so you might be sitting there wondering, so big deal, why would I drink hydrogen? I mean, hydrogen is the smallest molecule on the periodic table. Who cares about hydrogen? Well, let me tell you, you care about hydrogen. A lot about what we talk about in this podcast is about health span and lifespan. It's about aging well. It's about longevity. It's about managing your body system so that you can look, feel, and perform your best. And molecular hydrogen delivers on these points like nothing else does. Think about this. Molecular hydrogen actually combats oxidative stress as well as supporting a healthy inflammatory response. Now, we know that inflammation is at the root of virtually every major disease out there. We also know that it help, it makes us basically age faster. So I would qualify molecular hydrogen as a preventative aging supplement, and it is one of the easiest, healthiest, best out there with zero negative side effects. It indirectly mitigates the damages of those three issues that ultimately lead the way in virtually any disease state and fundamentally is are the driving forces in why we age. We're talking about imbalances in oxidative stress, in inflammation, and as well as increased insulin resistance. So you don't really have to take my word for it, guys. You can go to the drinkhrw.com website, and I'm going to tell you that it is one of the most incredible repositories of research and articles all about molecular hydrogen. And you know what I love about this company is they don't just run around telling you how great molecular hydrogen is. They don't just cherry pick the best research articles. They're full on, flat out, pretty honest about this article, this clinical trial. Well, it didn't show us much yet. Here are the flaws in it, or here's what we think. It's an incredible resource, but I can tell you that Whatever it is that you're dealing with, there's probably a clinical trial going on somewhere um, looking at whether or not molecular hydrogen can be helpful. And I will tell you that in my practice, I've seen it be helpful to all kinds of people, people who are suffering from joint pain because molecular hydrogen is able to target inflammation, because it's able to support a healthy um inflammatory response in the body. And it also promotes antioxidant and oxidative balance. You guys, you don't want to just be taking antioxidants by the handful. You want something on board that's going to help to keep you in balance to not too high, not too low, just keep you in that Goldilocks state. So like I said, I have clients who were blown away about how effective this molecular hydrogen, taking it every day, sometimes soaking an injured joint in molecular hydrogen water, what a difference it made in their mobility and in their ability to recover um, from their injuries and even also, of course, from workouts. So you're gonna be hearing me talk a lot more about molecular hydrogen in the future. This is just the tip of the iceberg. I encourage you to go to drinkhrw.com forward slash superhuman, and you can use promo code longevity10, and that will get you 10% off everything that you purchase. And you can try molecular hydrogen for yourself. And by all means, reach out to me and let me know how you liked your molecular hydrogen experience. And by all means as well, please, please, please check out their website. It is one of the most incredible resources that I've seen for molecular hydrogen research. So thanks for being here today, guys. Enjoy the episode. Well, good morning, Jake Steiner, or I should say good evening for you because it's good morning for me. I got to go out and sort of watch the sunrise this morning. Um, oh, that, it's, and you are amazing for doing that. I really appreciate it. You know what, though? I think it's great. Like, I love watching the sunrise. So welcome to the show. It's such a pleasure to meet you. Well, thanks for having me. So, Jake, we, um, yeah, and I mean, watching the sunrise, using your eyes, right? Getting that information from the sun, from the light into your brain, into the pineal gland, getting that process started for making melatonin for tonight. 
Um, so I don't know if we're going to talk about that part of vision, but we're going to talk about eyes and vision and how the eye has been is greatly either misunderstood or misrepresented in our in our modern day society. So before we get into that, though, why don't you tell us a bit about you? Tell us how did you get to where you are today? What's your what's your story? The short version, I guess, is I used to be a stock trader and investor in various businesses. And that made me super fortunate in that I had a lot of time and was able to sort of semi-retire early. Had really bad eyesight though, like thick, thick glasses. Couldn't find my glasses without my glasses. Was just very, very blind. Um, Started in my early teens and just got progressively worse. And eventually early twenties, I reached a point where uh, I went to the optometrist and they said, you need stronger glasses again. And I said, why? And they said, it's genetic. And I am not a geneticist, but that to me seemed an odd, odd answer. And because my previous job was research uh, or then still currently job was research, I started doing research and I found that myopia, short-sightedness, not being able to see clearly far away is not a genetic illness, but a hundred billion dollar business. Mm. And the glasses we're told to wear are just adding to that profit and bottom line and us not understanding what's going on with our eyes. So you mentioned myopia. So let's, why don't we make the, that distinction for people, right? Cause we have different, we, there's astigmatism, which for my understanding is, is, has something to do with the shape of the functionality within the eye. And then myopia is when you can't see from far. And then we have, and this, confuses me to no end. There's myopia is one of nearsightedness or farsightedness, which makes no sense. And then there's the thing that happens to your eyes as you age, where you lose the ability to focus properly when you're trying to read something, which I find intensely irritating. So <laughs> just annoys so, me. <laughs> yeah. I so why don't we just make, if you don't mind, if we can explain to people kind of the distinction and, and how that relates to what you do. So myopia is nearsightedness, which, as you're saying very accurately, is annoying because it means you can't see clearly far away, Mm -hmm. right? Like farsightedness is the opposite. You can't see clearly up close. doesn't really make a lot of sense, but that's how they call it. Um, The the medical term, clinical term is myopia for shortsightedness, can't see clearly far away. Mm -hmm. And hyperopia is you can't see clearly up close. And then the third one, the age-related one is presbyopia. You can't see clearly up close, but just age-related. The first two are kind of similar stories. And the third is just an age thing that that is kind of a separate topic, I guess. And then there's the astigmatism, which is a completely other topic. Astigmatism is fairly uncommon. It's, it's, It's when you can't see clearly at a specific part of your vision so you're getting like ghosting a a double vision kind of an image without your glasses that it's not just blurry but that there's like a a second image or parts of another image kind of floating around that's generally the symptom of astigmatism mostly caused by lenses though so most people don't have a medical condition of astigmatism but that's kind of another little side it's interesting because i had um I had um, laser eye surgery, I'm going to say 21 years ago now. And um, at the time, it, it started a thing. And I don't think it's as bad now if I think, although I haven't driven at night in so long because I don't go anywhere these days. <laughs> but um, but at, at the time, it caused me to start seeing halos at night, like halos around lights. Um, I wonder if that's... And I, you know, which was sort of a side effect of the, of l- the laser eye surgery, which, you know, for me, it helped me to get rid of my contact lenses, which at that point were, I was at the point where wearing contacts was causing a lot of um, ulcers on my, on my cornea. So I was getting to the point where I wasn't tolerating contacts anymore. And I was like, okay, that's just, it was laser eye surgery was kind of new, not, it was newish still. Um, so walk myself in one day and let him, let him go at it. But anyway, it's, uh, it helped, it it helped me to ditch the glasses at least for, I would guess 
15, almost 20 years. And then I'm, I developed presbyopia. Yeah. So that's uh, lucky for you, right? Like for people who are considering laser eye surgery, it's great if it works out. And if it doesn't, the side effects are generally very much, most of the time, irreversible and can be really bad. So for anyone who considers LASIK, go on Google, look at LASIK complications, um, do a bit of research. The guy who got LASIK approved, the, the head of the FDA for that whole section, Morris Waxler, Dr. Morris Waxler, if you look him up on Google, he's since very much aggressively changed his opinion about that and says, biggest mistake of his life, LASIK should have never been approved. The side effect risk is much too high. If it worked out for you, it's fine. Like the side effects are, are a fairly immediate thing, but people are generally not told how generally risky it is in that if something goes wrong, there's no fixing it most of the time. Wow. That's, that, that's good for you. I mean, you're fine. Happy, I'm happy fine, I didn't fine. know that at the time. I mean, I'm fine. Um, I did yeah. have this thing where a piece of dust got caught under the flap that they had pulled back. So <laughs> I had to go back in and have, have, have them like reopen. And, and so that was kind of less pleasant. Anyway, that's about me. So let's talk about you. How did you go from being a stock trader to what you do today. So you figured out that it's a billion dollar industry, which is fine because a lot of business people would say, okay, I need to get me a piece of that. Um, but you didn't do that. What did you decide to do? <laughs> Actually, I own a lot of lens stock. I'm a big fan of, of the industry because it makes good amount of money for me. So my, my portfolio enjoys it. Um, the, the problem is this. So there's no malice there. There's no, uh, I'm not a big conspiracy person. It's just that a, a pair of lenses that go on your glasses cost the optometrist anywhere from $2 to $5, eight, if we're going crazy. Yeah. What you're paying retail is dramatically higher, mm -hmm. right? Like just dramatically. And there's tons of stuff online about how much this has been an incentive for especially larger chains to really push people to buy lenses and there's no real incentive for the people who sell lenses to be educated about what myopia really is, what really causes it and what lenses really do. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's just a problem of the, the fix is so convenient. It's so immediate. It, everybody's happy, right? You walk in there, you have no, they're not asking you to take any personal responsibility. They're not saying you're spending too much time playing on your phone. They're not saying you need to get outside more. They just sell you the glasses. You're happy. They're happy. Right. So it's 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 a supply and demand thing. In general, people appreciate the fact that they can just buy glasses. The problem with this whole thing is my favorite website, by the way, scholar.google.com. I don't know if you guys talk about this much. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, for those who are not familiar, all, all the clinical studies and research and not just general fluff, scholar.google.com, not to say that that scientific articles are the truth, but it's a little bit closer. And if you type in pseudomyopia, P-S-E-U-D-O, mm -hmm. myopia, or near-induced transient myopia, near-induced caused by near, yeah, tens of thousands of results of just clinical research, basically saying that your eyesight quote unquote, bad, you start to get nearsightedness, myopia, because there's a muscle in the eye mm -hmm. called the ciliary muscle mm -hmm. that gets tighter as you look at something up close. So there's a lens in your eye, the lens reshapes itself. It's flat during distance vision and it's curved during close-up vision. And what curves it is this muscle. And when, whenever you look at something like a phone screen distance, that muscle is extremely tight. Mm -hmm. and it stays extremely tight as long as you look at your phone. Screen distance, like laptop distance, a little bit less tight. TV distance, less tight. Real distance outdoors, the muscle's relaxed. Reading a book would, would cause it to go super tight, right, as well? It would cause it to, and the distance is the key. The whole, closer you hold something, the tighter that muscle gets. Okay. And what, what all of clinical science basically says is pseudomyopia, near-induced transient myopia, is so much of this close-up happens that eventually that muscle doesn't fully relax. So your eyes are stuck in some amount of close-up vision mode. They're not broken. There's not a genetic defect. There's not something that went wrong. It's just a muscle spasm. 
And then if we, when you go to the optometrist for the first time and you're at minus one, just very mild myopia, what they should say is put down the phone, go outside, come back in a week and your eyes are going to be fine, right? Because the, it's a muscle spasm. But they don't because they don't know. Because even though the funny, one of the funny things is when you go to Google Scholar and read all of this science, well-established, it's all in, in peer-reviewed journals for optometry and ophthalmology. Like the funny thing is and myopia, the, the website, most of the things I quote are optometry journals. So these are things written for optometrists saying all these things, right? So there's not a big conspiracy. It's, it's literally, you can read the stuff. It's made for these people who are though in the business of selling glasses, you know, economic interests, like nobody makes any money telling people what I tell people, which yeah. is you got to get away from that screen, right? Like that is the, the first thing. And then, trying to keep the short story short. The second part is lens induced myopia. Again, go to Google scholar and type in lens induced myopia, meaning myopia caused by lenses. Again, you're going to get tens of thousands of results. I mean, I mean, just the vast majority of clinical science discussing what makes your eyesight worse is the lens wear. And we can go into as much or as little detail as you like about this. But basically, as soon as you start wearing glasses, your eyes don't know that there's glasses in front of them. They compensate for that lens, they elongate, and your myopia gets worse. So this whole thing is a muscle spasm that is treated quick fix with a pair of lenses, which then cause more of the symptom, which then cause you to buy more lenses and on and on until you stop at some amount of myopia that's different for everybody. So sometimes we get um, little kids who you see small children wearing glasses. Is that is that generally because of different of different types of conditions, or might it be because it, how would you how would you know with a small child? Because little kids don't typically read things up. You know, they're too young for that kind of stuff. Would, do you have any thoughts on that, or is that a different set of circumstances? There is, so there's a few things. One, I'm not a doctor, right? Like anything I say is, I mean, we're literally talking about stock trader dude who just started reading science and is quoting it. Um, At a good distance. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, next one. Yes. Um, <laughs> lots of eye conditions exist, none of which I have any comment on, right? Like I really okay, only so deal with, is... yeah, but, 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 but. This kids with glasses thing used to be a non-issue. I've been doing this for almost 20 years now. And this was a non-topic. Five-year-olds with glasses was not, just never on the radar. I get emails almost literally every single day from parents now with little kids, went to the optometrist, kids were squinting, blinking, whatever, got glasses. And the question I always ask is how much of your babysitting is an iPad? And mm -hmm. it's a lot right? And it's the same thing. It's a muscle spasm that now happens younger because before a five-year-old wasn't reading a book, right? There was no close-up screen. Maybe they watched cartoons, but the TV was far enough away where it was not yeah. really an issue. A, a toddler holding a phone is a terrible situation. It's mm -hmm. like giving a toddler- On a bunch of levels. Yeah. Yeah. It's like giving a toddler whiskey. It's, it's, it's going to have that effect on the eye. The muscle will lock up. They take it to kid to the optometrist. The optometrist will say, "Whoa, it's myopia." Kid gets glasses. Eyesight gets worse very rapidly, because the eye, the child's eye, adopt very quickly to the glasses. Every year you go go back, it's adopted worse. So that's a really problematic situation, largely caused by babysitters that are that are phone screens and iPads. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, it's interesting because I developed my my myopia. I developed probably when I was, I want to say or it was diagnosed when I was 12 or 13 years old, I was a huge reader. I mean, yeah. there were no phones at the time. I was a huge reader, but the whole genetic thing goes out the window because frankly, neither of my parents wore glasses or wear glasses to this day. I mean, they have presbyopia, but neither of them are nearsighted. So, um, so that kind of, you know, it's not like I came from a family, a long line of people wearing spectacles kind of thing. Nobody uh, is, nobody is. Nobody is. There's no, this idea that, that our, our collective genes failed in the last 50 years and dramatically more in the last 20 years and dramatically more since screens became prevalent is it's completely unlikely, right? Like th this idea that 
that our genome changed so rapidly in a couple of decades, it's just not feasible, right? Like if you mm -hmm. talk to anybody who's into genetics, I'm not certainly, they're going to tell you that this is not, it's, it's a very unlikely answer. But you go to Google Scholar and the likely answer is right there. Like right? it's not, you don't have a genetic problem. I got it at 12, somewhere around that age range. When you ended up going yeah. to school, when you ended up reading a lot more, when you ended up homework and then reading books, that was the age that we all got glasses. Now the age gets mm -hmm. younger because right, more screens, more close-up time. But that's, yeah. that's all it is. And my problem and the reason I'm so much, I like trolling retail optometry, as I call them, is because we don't have this conversation, right? Like you go to McDonald's, you know it's bad for you and you eat it, cool great. But McDonald's doesn't proclaim that this, it's the only food and it's, you need to eat it because genetics, right? The awareness, like if you take your kid to the optometrist and the optometrist says, well, the iPad shouldn't be a babysitter. I'll sell you glasses if you want. Just giving people a choice of taking a quick fix or doing something about the actual issue is not present right now. Yeah, it's a very different conversation for sure. Um, okay, so leaving aside the fact that there's other things that people can develop that are not, we're really speaking about something very specific. So how did you come to, because you've developed a whole series of courses, what was the next phase from Google Scholar? Did you read, so there's, um, is he a doctor, Bates? There's the Bates method that's been out there since what, the 1930s, is it? Like it's- Turn of the century. It's a hundred year old thing. Dr. William Bates was an optometrist and he had the right hunch. This was at a time where we knew very little and we didn't have the tools to explore eyesight at a level that we can today, right? So mm -hmm. he was basically a guy who said, it's a close up strain problem. In Bates okay. days, people didn't have screens. A lot of people didn't go to school. A lot of people didn't read. So it was very much just a muscle spasm issue. And he had the right idea, right? Like he had ideas like palming and sunning and all eye exercises, all this stuff to relieve that muscle spasm. He was correct, right? I make fun of Bates method teachers today a lot because I hold a bit of a grudge because we know a lot more today. And what worked for a very small percentage of the population who had a little muscle spasm from occasional reading is not going to help somebody with thick glasses today who lives in front of a screen. Right. So it was like a hundred years ago, it was the right hunch. If optometry would have listened to Bates today, nobody would be wearing glasses. But in the place that we are now, the Bates method thing isn't very effective because it doesn't address, because like Bates teachers say, throw away your glasses, terrible idea. Right. And do all these eye exercises every day for ever. Right. It's not a very practical approach, but yeah. it was a, it was a right direction. It was a good start. Um, yeah. for me, it was a hunch in the beginning. Also, right? I didn't know. I just read your eyeball elongates and it's a mechanism that, that is super interesting. There's the, the muscle that adjusts for near and far vision. And since the eye is basically a fluid filled membrane, right? It's never perfectly round. It never maintains its shape perfectly. So it has a built in mechanism to adjust itself in length for all the, until the day you die, right? And when you put that lens in front of it, you move the light further back and moving the light further back, um, hyperopic to focus is one to look up on Google Scholar, causes the eye to elongate because it thinks it's too short, right? You put on the glasses, glasses move the light back further, eyeball goes, I'm too short, it grows longer. But it's not a one-way conversation. It also shortens if the light hits in front of the eye or in front of the retina, instead of behind the retina, the eyeball also shortens. So my theory on that was, if that's the case, if I wear weaker glasses, my eyeball should adjust to them. And this was a very rough theory. And my initial experience with it was not fun. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, it took me a long time to make improvements. I eventually did. And friends got curious because I annoyed everybody about it. And then friends tried it. And over the intervening two decades, lots and lots and lots of people experimented with this. And we've kind of developed a way to make it easy and habit-based. And once you learn the basics, I don't wear glasses today. I have 20, 20 eyesight. And uh, if you look on the website, we, we have a podcast. I talk to people, lots and lots of people 
recovered their normal eyesight, went back to the DMV, got the driver's license with no correction necessary. We basically figured out how every year you can go down by a doctor till you no longer need glasses fairly effectively. But this is very much a DIY project. It's kind of on the on the edge of things, right? Like it's biohacking. It can be debated whether we're crazy or not, but it certainly is. Well, biohacking is debatable, but that's okay. <laughs> right, yeah, for sure. It's it's certainly for people that that feel strongly about the eyesight and it gets into lots of topics that I won't really turn this into a five-hour podcast with you, but from everything from posture to sports performance to your self-image to stress levels, when you don't have peripheral vision because you only have this forward vision, how you interact with people because you're you only see clearly through those f- main parts of your lenses. So you your neck movement is different than people who don't wear glasses, who have more eye movement, make you seem more introverted, weird, different, nerdy. There's so many things that that connect to the fact that you have to wear corrective lenses. And the people that care enough about that to take that action, play this biohacking game a lot of them have been pretty successful. Like my message is nobody needs glasses if you're willing to put in the effort. So how much effort is it? Like how much work does it take for someone who's wearing glasses to, how long does it take typically? I'm guessing there's no, you know, one week and this is gonna happen. It's gonna depend from person to person. But how long does it take in general and how much work does it take every day? Because I know the Bates method, I told you this story before we started, my father-in-law long, long, long time ago was sitting in his chair every morning doing his cupping and ex- doing all these different exercises. His entire family thought he was completely crazy at the time. Um, I call him the original biohacker. <laughs> I mean, he's gone now, but, uh, but, um, but, it, but, but yeah. So how, how long, why don't you tell us a little bit about how long it takes or the amount of work it involves? One of the things we figured out uh, is that nobody, or not nobody, but in general, people don't have the time to deal with all this, right? Like I don't. Yeah. Like, but they don't take you, the time anyway. You improve, yeah, we have other things to do. So you can improve about a doctor a year. That seems to be the biological limit that we found anyway, right? So oh, one doctor a year, you're not going to oh, do exercises. Okay. So in my case, I was at minus five, five, six years, thereabouts. I'm not going to do exercises for five or six years. So we built a habit-based system. The The effort is basically up front. You're going to spend a month or two getting to know your eyes, right? And understanding doctors and understanding your glasses, understanding how to measure your eyesight at home, which turns out is really super simple. Uh, realizing that lighting affects your eyesight significantly and stress and the food you eat and how much time you spend binging on Netflix. You basically, you're, you're going to spend, I would say a month, immersing yourself in understanding how you and your eyes get along in your lifestyle. After you figure it all out, it's more or less autopilot. There's going to be tweaks and you're going to run into little roadblocks and stuff. But once you make a reduction, the second reduction is three to four months. Every three to four months, you can reduce a quarter diopter on average. And for most people, as long as they have good habits, it's kind of a zero effort thing other than you can't binge on your phone indefinitely, right? Like that's, it really turns into a thing of close up needs to be a a limited activity. Like if you're doing close up stuff, put it on a computer screen or a TV, right? Like the closer you are, the tighter that, that muscle is, the more likely it is to spasm. So once you understand all of this stuff and how strong the glasses are that you really need, it's super simple. It's again, why nobody makes money off of this. You asked me about my courses and I said, my stuff is free because once you figure this out, there's no money in it and anybody can do it or teach it or tell people about it, right? Like it's just wear weaker glasses by just a little bit. So you get, so basically people are wearing, are they're measuring their eyesight regularly and downgrading their glasses as they go. Cause you're basically, you're not telling people throw, like what my father-in-law did was throw his glasses away. He went to some, you know, he went to the Sally Ann down the street, tried on different glasses until he found a pair that he felt would be acceptable, you know, for driving and off he went kind of thing. But um, you're not telling people to throw away their glasses overnight, but rather to self-evaluate and continue, which 
you know, could be a pricey proposition, but you can get glasses pretty cheap online now, right? Like I'm weird. I know my optometrist, my ophthalmologist rants about this every time I'm in there. It's like, oh yeah, people think they can go online and get these glasses. And it's, and I'm sitting there going, well, dude, you're charging like a cheap pair of glasses when I go in there is $600. And they're always the ones I lose to be clear. Okay. So there's, there's a few things that are worth noting here is one is ophthalmologists do a lot more than measure myopia, right? Like, so I go to an ophthalmologist once a year, get an eye checkup. I'm not against modern medicine in general. No. The thing with myopia though, is it's incredibly simple to measure your myopia. It's a distance to blur. You pick up a book and a measuring tape. You put the measuring tape next to your eye socket and you hold the book. You, the text is perfectly clear. Hold it close, close enough where the text is perfectly clear. And then just slowly move it away till there's a tiny bit of blur. You measure that distance. 100 divided by that distance equals the diopters of your glasses. Cool. That's okay. it. I mean, people, are, people, especially not into math, just immediately blank out. But it's literally, right, like, just measure the distance in centimeters, write it down and, t- and then take a calculator and go hundred divided by the distance. That is your quote unquote prescription, which by the mm-hmm. way, was not a prescription till millions of dollars of lobbying happened and they made it a prescription. But when, when these people rant that people can't figure out glasses, I'm like, that is not really true because it's, it's literally, that's all it is. The optometrist office, the eye chart, them doing all of this stuff, it, they do nothing else than measuring how far you can see before this blur, period. So number one, right? Like there's nothing else to it. It's a charade other than that. It's distance to blur. There's nothing else to myopia. And diopters, people are like, I don't know what these numbers mean. 100 divided by the distance equals the diopters of your glasses, right? Like all there's to it. So a, a monkey could do it, right? And then you go online and because that ophthalmologist paid seven dollars for your six hundred dollar glasses minus the frames but he did like i have all the wholesale price sheets for every brand these things are disturbingly inexpensive Mm -hmm. huge profit margin granted right like they don't make dentist money but the margin is huge so eventually since the internet came somebody is going to make a reasonable profit and charge you 20 bucks and still make right like a couple hundred percent profit on this and you mm-hmm. can measure that distance for yourself. It, the, the jig is up with this, right? Like it's, I keep saying one day Amazon is going to do an app with the same thing where you just, we have an app actually on the, on the Apple store. It yeah, it's not perfect, but you can basically hold the phone in front of your face. The front facing camera measures that distance for you. So you don't need a measuring tape. And at any distance you hold it, it tells you how many adopters of glasses you need if that's where the blur starts. Because that's all there's to it, right? It's just a distance to blur. If Amazon did this and then sold you glasses based on that, retail optometry is just over, right? The the same way Uber and Grab or whoever, uh, Airbnb, all of these things are taking over old retail where there's a hole, right? Like supply, demand, and so on. This will happen because that's all it is. It's distance to blur. You don't need an optometrist to tell you this thing. And then you can just buy, right? Like now they have this VR stuff where you can try on glasses virtually and all that stuff. So the dude complaining, like that part of the business is on its way out. It's blockbuster, you know? So, and But this is really about nearsightedness. So when I go to my optometrist, I mean, my ophthalmologist admittedly, He's measuring all kinds of other stuff. He's looking at peripheral vision. He's, you know, he's looking for degradation in the, in the lens. You know, they're looking for legit disease. Now, what about, what about presbyopia? Is presbyopia, is it possible to correct presbyopia? Or, or is that just the gig is up? <laughs> presbyopia. <laughs> so presbyopia, the lens hardens with age. Um, the lens is flexible, right? Like, so the closer you look at something, that more that lens bulges. As you get older, the lens becomes harder. So it's more effort for the ciliary muscle to, to, to shape that lens for close-up. So you lose, some, that's why you lose some of the more extreme close-up vision because the muscle yeah. just can't shape that lens as well anymore. I, I don't know of a fix for that. Like diet may help, things may help, who knows? The thing though that that's tangible is the stronger the 
plus glasses, reading glasses you wear, the less you make the ciliary muscle work, the less that lens continues to be shaped anyway, the more you depend on those glasses. So my recommendation is always natural daylight, wear the weakest amount of reading glasses possible and only when you really need them. You can, right. you, can, you can delay or prevent your dependence on lenses, even though that lens hardens. And because I deal with so many people, I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of people more than that. I have not heard of anybody getting presbyopia symptoms who has improved their myopia. And this is highly anecdotal. Like I'm not claiming this to be some victory over presbyopia, but it's just, it seems that once you become aware of your eyesight and you get better habits in general, and you learn what strains your eyesight and you just have a better relationship in general, that you're not going to be so likely to reach for the strongest possible reading glasses, right? Because yeah. if you put on plus 2.5s, you're, you're, the muscle has to put in zero work. And now that, that lens can harden all at once because it's not continuing to be worked out. So my, my recommendation is just try not to rely on those more than you need. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And that is interesting that the people that do the work on the nearsightedness would, it makes sense in a way that you would, if you did develop presbyopia, you might develop it later or not at all. Yeah. If, I mean, if, I'm almost 50, right? And that's completely anecdotal. That's a <laughs> one person's experience, but I can hold things as close as I want. I can see them perfectly fine. And I also, like I live in, I spend a lot of time in Southeast Asia. Nobody wears reading glasses. And I used to just do this for no reason fun because there's all these old ladies that do that, that fix your pants and make bags and everything. None of them wear glasses and they're, they're working really up close. And I used to always ask, Hey, how old are you? How much of this do you do a day? And there's 70, 80 plus year olds, never seen any of them with reading glasses. Again, you know, people roll their eyes, how much that's anecdotal, but nobody is, they're not going to the annual checkup anyway. Right. And if they did, there isn't really that heavy push to oh, you your 40 something, you should get reading glasses. Right. Because if you're mid forties, you throw on reading glasses, you will probably find out oh, that's a little more comfortable, but that's the comfortable oh. you don't want. Right, right, right. So stay a little discomfort. So you mentioned earlier, so you mentioned a couple of interesting things. So talking about stress and how um, not being able to see properly around you, you know, losing that because your glasses don't typically wrap around. So losing kind of aspects of your peripheral vision and how that might affect the nervous system. Have you looked at, into that at all? Because that, you know, in some ways it would be one of those, it could potentially be one of those low level, you don't notice it kind of stressors, but that the body registers as, you know, like we're more vulnerable from over here from a, from an evolutionary perspective, you know, and our brains are old and, do you ever talk about that at all or I, not really? I try my best to stay really on this simple one message thing because I'm always wow. worried about deluding into where I'm not a real expert and also getting into topics where people will debate and maybe find that I'm not right. right? So I'm really careful to just stick with the things that I'm, I'm really certain of. Right. That said... <laughs> Right. If if we're gonna if we're gonna if we're gonna go off off the script, um, I've talked to psychologists at more than a few times. We had interesting conversations about if you don't have peripheral vision, that that system in your brain that lets you know that a predator is coming, is mm -hmm. in constant high alert because all it knows is it can't see. Right. Like mm -hmm. you can see. I can see my hands. Right. Like. They're almost 180 degrees. I can still see them. I'm wearing glasses. I can't see anything out there. There's just a border around my vision. And people postulate, people who are more in that area than I am, that that creates this chronic stress that is always there that says something's not right about right. my peripheral. And I've heard people talk about it makes it 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 shows that a person seems more fidgety, more nervous, more uncomfortable, less relaxed in their normal interactions because they're always right. They're looking at you through those lenses and they can't see anything that's going on around them. And they're just in a less relaxed state than we are. I don't know if it's true. I like yeah. to, I like to mention these probabilities just for people who feel that way and wear glasses and may be tempted by something like that to, to consider removing glasses as at one possible 
issue, right? Right. And what about contact lenses? Is that the same problem? Because I would think that the contact lens protects your vision. Like, you know, you, you have much fuller, possibly more, better integrity to your vision from a contact that is closer to the eye. It's still going to have the same effect, but. Absolutely. Love contacts. Contacts are great. Contacts give you the optical quality is much higher than glasses. Again, you get peripheral vision with contact lenses. Contact lenses are amazing. Love contact yeah. lenses. Tiny issue with contact lenses is <laughs> when you're focused on a close-up object, your blink rate reduces by a factor of five. So you blink five times less when you're staring at your screen. Blinking is what, what delivers tear fluid to your eyes, right? Which mm -hmm. you need for all kinds of things, lipid layer for people who want to research it. One of the things that the tear fluid does is let the contact lens float in it. So now you blink mm -hmm. five times less, the contact lens, there's, not, there's less tear fluid, the contact lens is going to be tempted to adhere more to your eye. Corneal thinning uh, is one of the potential issues where the cornea starts to get thinner because of long-term contact lens wear. It's another thing, Google Scholar, if you look up corneal thinning, you'll find tons of studies discussing this. It seems to not be reversing itself when you stop wearing contact lenses. And this is not for six months or a year, but if you plan to just go, I got contacts, I'm fine for the rest of my life, you are definitely still not getting anything for free, right? Like there's still a biological price to pay for that for that. And then there's like scarring and ulcers and the things that you talked about. So it's not yeah. free, right? Like it's still, you're still better off using contact lenses, but also reducing your dependence on them over time. Yeah. Well, and I, as an ex contact lens wearer, cause I finally did go for the LASIK eye surgery. And ultimately it was because I started to lose my ability to wear contacts. And I think anybody who wears contacts knows like late at night, you're going to, because you, you get dehydrated, the lens gets dehydrated and they become kind of scratchy. You might feel like you have something in your eye all the time. I mean, I was getting those ulcers. I'm sure my cornea was starting to thin. Like I wore lenses, I wore contacts. Uh, let me think. Probably 20, 25 years. Right now I was lucky that I always had um, doctors who, although they gave me the disposable kind, made me promise not to wear them overnight. Like they were the, the extended wear. And so they made me promise you can have these, but you can't wear them over. Like do not wear them overnight. It'll be, they were already, they, you know, they were, they were good enough to say, this is going, this could cause trouble for you yeah. if, if you do that. So. The best, the best thing really is because you need two pairs of glasses. Like the whole amyopia thing is predicated on don't wear correction more than you need. And yeah. when you sit in front of a screen and you, you wear glasses meant for distance, hyperopic to focus, the things that makes your eyes worse is happening the most when you wear distance glass for close up. So the first thing I say is if you're going to do nothing else, get a pair of glasses, a diopter and a half less than your distance glasses. You can see a computer screen fine, but not further much better for your eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Those close-up glasses shouldn't be contact lenses because while you're staring at your computer screen, reduce blink rate, you don't use your peripheral vision anyway. That's a lot of hours. So if you got, if you go to work, you're going to be there eight hours, wear glasses for your screen use and then wear contacts when you're out doing sports and fun stuff and weekends with the family and whatever else. Like understanding the use case is, is handy with contacts. Yeah. Yeah. I like your approach. I mean, it's, it, you're not, I mean, you know, again, like, you know, you never know what to expect when you meet people. And so you're going to be one of two things. You're either going to be like, you know, this crazy guy that's like, throw away your glasses. <laughs> or um, I, I is, this all makes a lot of sense. Have you, do you address it all with, um, with people about things about does nutrition in any aspect of nutrition that maybe healthier for eyes. I mean, we know vitamin A is vital for eyes, but there's more, you know, the eyes are an extension of your brain. They, like it's, this is, this is a big deal. It's not just one vitamin that's going to address eye health, but in terms of nutrition, hydration, do you sp speak to people about that? Is that, is that within your purview or? I don't because I don't, my brain is tiny and nutrition is such a giant topic. Um, what, what I generally say when it comes to vitamins and stuff is, I, I personally am a fan of blood panels. Like I, I go mm -hmm. to a lab a 
couple times a year and I just get all the blood work done directly at the lab, right? So if I have a vitamin or mineral or nutrient deficiency, it shows up right there. And then I supplement based on deficiency rather than just blindly, right? Just eating a bunch of vitamin A, which might not be good for you, right? If you're not deficient, don't know, right? Like that's, it's a topic where I'm like, I'm not an expert and it would take too much for me to, to know enough to reliably be, to be able to say, do this or don't do that. But what you said is not, the eyes are not separate from the body, right? Like if you're, mm-hmm. if you're having deficiencies, for example, uh, insulin spikes, bad for eyesight. Hugely mm-hmm. bad for eyesight. Yeah. Some people may notice more than others, but if you're measuring your eyesight and you're wearing lower correction glasses and then you eat a giant pizza and you don't have a Coke and all of a sudden your computer screen's not clear anymore. While that insulin spikes happening, your eyesight's going to be less good. Same with diabetics. Diabetics are usually also myopic. Mm-hmm. So all connected, right? And and my topic is just this little small piece where I'm, if you if you wear lower strength glasses and you focus on a little bit of blur and clearing it up, you're going to not depend on glasses anymore in the future. And then all the other things that affect your body and health, go find on your podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's interesting. But it, but it is um, the blood sugar spikes and how they affect vision. I didn't realize they affected vision that in an immediate sense. But talking about, you know, your, your AGEs, like your, your advanced glycation end products, like oxidation in the eye, like all the damage that can happen in the eye from all the supply, the blood flow, the, the nutrients that are going to being delivered or not delivered, I think is a really interesting topic as well. Um, and hydration is another one. Like you get dehydrated, you're, as you said, like the eye, it's fluid. I mean, it's not fluid, it's, it's gel, but it will, it'll be affected by dehydration ultimately. So. The, the, the lipid layer, so the tear fluid layer on, on top of your eye is definitely affected. I mean, even if you just dehydrate yourself for one day, you're going to start noticing dry eyes or you spend four hours in front of Netflix laying in bed with the air conditioning on, you're going to have dry eyes and you wake up the next morning and your eyes will feel dry, immediate effect, right? Yeah. But again, it's that whole system thing where that dehydration is probably bad for other things also besides Absolutely. your eyes, right? Like it, and that's why I think as we're having these conversations, all these things are connected, right? Like mm-hmm. I love these podcasts because you listen to enough episodes, enough people talking out different pieces, and eventually you realize it's all hooked together, right? Like mm-hmm. there's no, there's no real separate anything. And just some of us have this little area where, that we know more about, but somebody wearing glasses, whether you start with glasses or whether you start with nutrition, wherever you start, you start realizing there's all these bits to take care of that a lot of the mainstream, unfortunately, will just give you symptom treatments for. For sure. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, that's, that's so true. And so when you, so we, we started off talking a little bit about screens and how they've just made the problem, they've exacerbated the problem in part because people are just staring at their screens. Do you think that there's a piece of it that's tied to the type of light that we're getting from our screens, that artificial blue light? I mean, which people are starting to mitigate with, you know, with apps or with blue blocking glasses. Now, and that was the other thing I wanted to ask you, like about blue blocking glasses it's still a lens. Is that still also going to affect the ability of the eye to, to, to do its job properly? Do you think? Have my you looked favorite, into that at all? My, my favorite thing about blue blocking glasses is the same as Wonder Bread. You remember Wonder Bread? Just a white bread, like a terrible white bread. And it would say fortified with vitamins on it. It's like Coke Zero. Right, like the problem with Coke is not Coke, it's the sugar. So then they substituted the sugar with something else. And the problem with this white bread isn't that it's empty crap calories, it was missing some vitamins, which we now added. Blue blocking glasses, in my humble opinion, are the same thing. The problem is your screen, right? The problem is mm-hmm. is drinking Coke. I don't care what kind of Coke it is. It's you put on the blue blocking glasses and you tell yourself this addiction that I'm having here is not a problem anymore because I, I'm filtering some part of the light spectrum. While yes, the blue light is a problem. It's the screen that is the real problem, right? Like yeah. I, I, I struggle with the blue blocking glasses because I think you'll be fine not drinking Coke and you'll be fine not playing on your phone when you're at dinner with your friends, right? Like the blue blocking isn't going to fix it. 
side anecdote, I used to play on my phone every night or iPad, just watch YouTube videos. I did massive addiction problem. I used to have other substance addiction problems. So I recognize it. So I made a deal with friends is we either watch a movie on a real screen at a real distance, or we go do other stuff. We don't do mm -hmm. the screen thing at night. These little things are much more effective than saying, I'm going to buy another product that's going to mitigate what I know is a problem. Right. So, but as far as light spectrum, otherwise though, the like lighting in shopping malls, for example, even oh, though yeah. it appears to be pretty bright, is terrible. And that's, yeah. you can just measure again, that, that distance measurement, you can do that in, in a shaded, natural lit environment. And you maybe, for example, you get 30 centimeters and you try the same thing in a shopping mall and you might get 22, right? Like your vision will be measurably worse in that weird, narrow spectrum lighting that again, I'm not a light expert, but there's certainly, I noticed the impact of these weird artificial lights longer term, especially on, on how your eyes perform. Yeah. Well, I would say that, you know, the blue blockers for me is, I mean, I have, I have a lot of biohacker friends who've replaced all the light in their house um, or have options of the light in, lighting in their house that goes red um, after sunset which is great in my house. It's not entirely practical because of the people I live with and because of the size of the house. And I don't know where I'd put all these lights <laughs> anyway, but um, so the blue blockers for me that I wear at night is more a question of addressing the ambient lighting than it is um, my, the, the, the screen issue, because I have noticed that if I play a game on my phone before bed, my sleep metrics the next morning are never as good as if I stay away. If I don't watch TV in the hour before bed, my sleep metrics are always better the next day. So with or without the blue blockers, I can, I physically now, I don't like not wearing blue blockers after a certain hour. Yeah. I feel like it, it relaxes me. You know, I just, I find lighting harsh at night. Yeah. And I'm not, and I'm not to say you shouldn't wear blue blocking glasses. I just no, I think might come from this place of people don't address the screen problem yeah. and try to substitute. I agree. Like at night I try, I really don't like artificial light and all the lights here are very yellow. Um, yeah. I only have yellow bulbs and that's not because I profess that that's better. But for me personally, I agree with you. I don't like that whitish blue light at night either. It's just, I'm coming from this from the meal angle where people yeah, yeah right you know yeah no well they're band-aiding the solution and continuing with the behavior that is the problem in the first place i totally get that and then you know to your point the lighting in um malls or also i found at conferences in these big conference centers i will wear i will wear yellow the yellow lens blue blockers in those circumstances only because i find again it it's more relaxing to me. I find if I spend a whole day in a conference, like under that kind of artificial crazy lighting that they have in there, I get exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> like it just zaps me. And you end up, I end up with a headache almost all the time. And just not wearing the dark blockers, but that just that little filter that maybe, you know, alters the lighting, takes the edge off the lighting a little bit seems to be helpful yeah. but then you get you know you get i can't remember her name right now but there's a woman where who's got this whole thing with glasses where you do a lot of very very um trying to remember the name she, you do very very extensive testing with these different light fil color filters and they develop a lens and i don't know if you've even come across this but they develop a lens that's very specific to how you perceive different colors of light. And they say that the belief is that, that, um, that it's just gonna be much more beneficial for your brain health and your ability to learn and bring in information. So it's not, they're not glasses necessarily that address nearsightedness or farsightedness, but they're glasses that filter the light to make it healthier for your brain. Have you come no. across that at all? No, and I probably, I wouldn't be the, the guy too either way because i have a bias mm -hmm. i'm a simple creature right i said go outside yeah well as and, i'm saying as i'm describing it to you i'm like he's sitting there going yeah right okay <laughs> but it's not i'm not saying i i recognize my bias and i'm not saying it's good or bad i'm just saying i'm not the person to ask because i'm always i i 
I always go for the simplest possible solution. My fault, right? It makes no money either. Like the things that I recommend are just pick up a sport or a hobby and enjoy your real surroundings and distance vision as much as possible. So I'm not, right? Like some of these things may be awesome and I'm just, right? Like before the proverb, proverbial crap hit the fan, I lived in a totally off-grid house completely. Just, you know, water, electric, all of our stuff, food was just off-grid. I'm more in that, you know, a little bit hippie nature direction and less products to readjust myself. But that's not to say that I think it's better or not, but I just don't know. Yeah. Right, like yeah. Well, I think it addresses a different problem as I as I as I talk about it. But I'll I'll find the name, guys, and I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. Um, and um, because I think it it speaks to it speaks to a whole different different issue. So um, so in terms of your courses, so you've got a whole whack of courses. I went to your website when I first heard about you and we first booked this podcast, and they're awful. Yeah, no courses. Um, everything that you need is free. And I have this luxury because I'm, I'm okay financially. I always say there's a learning curve. There's no, sometimes people come and say, okay, just give me the quick steps. There's no, it's not going to be very effective unless you say I'm taking a class, right? I'm giving myself, I'm taking a half an hour in the evening that I'm learning about this stuff, how to measure mm-hmm. my eyes and how the opters work and how my habits are good and bad. And I'm just going to learn about this stuff on the website. We have a big, Facebook group with 20 some odd thousand members. We have a bigger than that forum where there's lots of conversation going on the website. We have a terrible YouTube channel. We've got a little podcast. There's lots of (laughs) options to immerse yourself in this. I I say you don't need to spend money. Like it's two pairs of glasses, slightly lower than, than you're currently wearing. You don't buy them till you know exactly what you need. And from there, it's just kind of a fun adventure, right? Um, Courses once in a while, when I have time, when I can, I love doing them, but they're not, it's not something you need to, to fix your vision. Well, it's a commitment, right? It's a way for people to commit to a process. They spend a little bit of money. So it's part of their commitment yeah. and maybe they're a bit more likely to stick with it and do the work because can, what you're really saying is at the end of the day, you're going to have to do the work. Yeah. You can email me to have a wait list. I don't like to say it, but I do. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, sometimes the, I, I spent money. I'm serious about this is helpful. I, again, it's the hippie bias a little bit where I'm like, I don't want to make people spend money to address this issue. Right. Like I have a wait list. Normally I have more availability. I, we talked about my family, Myanmar, the current situation. I'm just not in a space where, because with the courses I offer support and I spend time with people and stuff and I just have it at the moment. Right. So I haven't. Oh, so that's that. why they're full. So you're just limited. Capacity. No, they are full, but I'm, I'm, I'm taking a less capacity. I've been doing like 10 spots a month. And so that's a little bit of support time, but I don't have to overcommit. And I'm not like, there's definitely days where I'm not in the right brain space to be online dealing with things. But mm-hmm. hopefully if anybody follows the news, if Myanmar stops killing people, then there'll probably be more courses available again. Yeah, that would be a nice thing. It's uh, it's a little bit hard to understand those things and how they're ever going to get resolved. Um, yeah, well, I'm sorry to hear about your family. That's I can't imagine how stressful that is. Yeah. So, but doesn't affect right. Like it definitely. I think it's super worth it if you're going to do nothing else. Just learn how to measure your eyesight, and then look at your so-called prescription and look how that relates, and then think about buying a pair of glasses, adopt and half lower, and just make it a little thing, just measure, right? Like nice natural daylight versus terrible office lighting and just see how much your eyesight varies and start making friends with your eyes, like understand mm-hmm. like where that and how they're doing and how the iPad is affecting them and maybe move some of your viewing habits to a TV or a projector. And slowly over time, you start just ending up in a much better place for your eyes. Yeah. I, you almost want to start sharing this message with younger people. Because, I mean, I'm sitting here all sad I got laser eye surgery because I can't do it. <laughs> I was like, damn, I could have saved so much money. Um, but, um, but if you can catch them young, um, you could, I mean, first of all, I would imagine it would be so much easier. The earlier you catch this, the easier it's going to be, hopefully, to correct it. It's a tougher sell with a young person, like a teenager to say, don't stare at your phone, don't stare at your screen, 
um, do these exercises, do this stuff. But at the same time, I'll bet I would imagine the fix is way quicker in that age group than it would be with every passing decade. Yeah. There's actually a lot of younger people and I feel weird saying that that means I'm old, but in, in well, younger f- doesn't, doesn't even, mean they're, doesn't mean young. It just means younger than you, even younger than us. I'm almost 50. I'm, I'm just getting old. You're almost 50. You're way behind me, dude. So let's just be clear. <laughs> well, okay, fine. But yeah, so there are tons and lots of them. And I think there's a lot of enthusiasm. And But it, now it's a weird topic. I feel really strange because I say, go outside. And yeah. you're younger, right? Like kids are going, what am I going to do? And we literally have to have conversations. So there's hobbies, right? It's weird that now there are people that are, that are raised in an age where the internet was always there. And we have yeah. to go, boredom is the, one of the most valuable things you have. Like all mm-hmm. great things start with boredom. So put the thing away and let yourself get so properly bored that all kinds of things all of a sudden start sounding interesting that involve you interacting with the world around you right? Like whether you buy an old bike and fix it up or whether you learn something new, like going through the effort of not being instantly gratified by YouTube video is alien to a lot of people. When did the iPad come out? Do you know? know? I don't know. Because I'm trying to figure out how old are the first babies that started, you know, like you see little tiny kids, like two years old, one years old. So my son's 21 he didn't, he didn't have a phone until he was 12. Now I would think that's, well, I know that that's backed up. And so I'm just wondering, you know, when that generation of kids that, that have grown up in front of screens, I don't know. Um, we're going to start to see more and more of this stuff come up. More and more. And, and my, my boy's five now. And one of the very definitive rules is no phones. There's no phone. Just there's no phone. You can watch movies on an iPad, but the iPad is at, at a distance. One of the first yeah. words that he ever learned, he didn't even know to speak at all, was scooch back. Like he knew that. He was tiny still, and he would just kind of like <laughs> scooch back. Yeah, oh, just the distance from the screen. Like that's the number one. And there's no playing with phones. There just isn't. Right. Like I yeah. that's my firm rule. Like I pay I pay the bills and I pay the internet bills. I'm like kids playing on phones, it's gonna be no internet. Right. And that's just because this distance is terrible. And that whole part of the reason we moved into the off-grid jungle is so they would play outside, right? Like mm-hmm. sticks and things are very fascinating when you haven't heard of YouTube and they get dirty and they play outside all day. And I tried to keep them away from the modern world, at least for a little while, just mm-hmm. to, you know, not be in this whole instant gratification and attention deficit just from constant stimulation and all of this. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, look, it's giving them a good start, a good foundation. And ultimately you're not closing them off from technology completely. No, uh, definitely not. Because that would put them at a disadvantage down the road, but definitely giving them a chance to develop other interests and the ability as you point, you know, so you put it so well to get so bored that you come up with a solution that doesn't involve somebody else creating the entertainment for you kind of thing. Yeah. That's an incredible skill in life. It's so right? weird. Like, it's weird it's, that we have to say this weird. because in our day, back in our day, like th- this was yeah. a given, right? You getting bored yeah. was yeah. a g- given. You will get bored. Now you don't ever have to get bored. And I think that's a big tragedy as far as mm-hmm. it's the foundation of being creative, right? Like you have to be bored first. Absolutely. Or identify a problem that needs to be solved, which you ironically kind of did. I don't know if it was out of boredom when you left your stock trading job, but you know, what was it that, that got you to even think about this? I guess it was the fact that you wore these crazy glasses that you were looking for to solve X. Like, do I really need to be wearing this stuff? Yeah. I Is was there a better single. way? I was single and the stronger your glasses are, the smaller your eyes look behind them. So I had these little tiny beady eyes behind glasses so my motivation was just vanity basically vanity works vanity is a beautiful motivator and the problem is it'll push you in different directions it doesn't generally push you to find a solution like this that doesn't involve spending just throwing a bunch of money at the problem especially when you have the money to throw at the problem you know it's it's an interesting process that you would have gone through um because money was not your motive 
your mover. Yeah, true. It was yeah. curiosity more than anything, I'm guessing. Yeah, well, I mean, at the time, when the guy said it's genetic, I was like, yeah, I know it's not genetic, so that's weird. And then right. it was libraries back then. There was no Google Scholar when I started researching this. So I literally had to hoof it to university libraries and, and find the books and read the books. And it was just shocking. I literally, I took right. books to the optometrist and they just, they just shook their head at me and said, do you want glasses or not? And I'm like, it says right here. Right? And, and that disconnect was really amazing. It was just a weird, it was a weird experience, all of this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, from their perspective, that's not what they've been taught. Yeah. Whether they know it or not. Like if you think about it, these people go through school and they they're taught by teachers, people who know more than they do and they consume that information. It's not that common for people in that position to really question what they're being taught because they paid a lot of money to be here. They've been told this is we're going to teach you what you need to uh, to perform your chosen profession and to be good at it and to help people. Yeah. I mean, as you said earlier, nobody's in this out of malice. They're, this is what they've been taught. And so, you know, to come and challenge everything they've been taught, it takes a particular person to accept that challenge and revisit. We're seeing the same thing in functional medicine or, yeah. you know, in alternative healthcare. It's people who are willing to challenge the current dogma to say, yes, this is what you know, we, this is what we're taught, but is it possible that that those teachings were through a very specific lens and that we could look outside of that lens? Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Like my dad is a medical doctor and he loves statins and he won't look at any research that says that contradicts what he believes. So it's interesting. Yeah. It's a, he's a very intelligent guy. Like he's a very insightful guy, but our beliefs, like what we learn at some point and becomes a belief and you shared it with enough other people. That's a powerful thing. Like I've mm -hmm. witnessed it firsthand. He's just, he says, I'm going to die of a heart attack because I don't take statins. What can you do? And he doesn't take statins? Oh, he does. He loves statins. Oh, he does. He oh, I see. Statins. So he, would, he believes that if he didn't take statins, he would die of a heart attack. Yes, absolutely. And he tells right. me I will. And then I showed him, I'm like, I can play with my cholesterol numbers at will, right? Like just change the diet. But he won't look at it. He literally, he refuses to look at my blood test and he won't hear about it because he already decided that statins is the thing. And I, that's optometry and that's everything else. Like yeah, the foundation of reality is pillars of beliefs and upsetting one could upset all of them. So I get it. I understand. Well, and it simplifies life, right? Yeah. You don't have to constantly be questioning and learning and Right, revisiting yeah. and re crazy people like me going on the internet going you don't need glasses yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't need glasses guys <laughs> if you're booked that late sick eye surgery give yourself six months <laughs> try something different first yeah exactly okay well this is I, I this has been a thoroughly enjoyable way to start my day jake this has been a great conversation what else um what else can we share with people? Have we left anything out? And if not, then um, how can people find you? People can find us. Endmyopia.org is the website. And it can be a little intimidating at first because it's many years of accumulated stuff. Big community. You can find all the links. There's a big resources link with all the stuff. The first thing I would do is like question whether you'd be happier being less dependent on glasses. And if you would be, then think about it as a little project to explore. You know, no rush, no hurry. Just start reading stuff and maybe connect with the community. And it's not that difficult. And it's amazing. Like even going from minus five to minus four, like minus five to up to minus four, you see the world bigger, right? Like because yeah. minus lines make everything smaller uh, and introduces distortion. Colors are different. Like your lens has changed how you see everything. All you have to do is take your glasses take them off your nose and move them a little bit further in front of your face and see how messy that image is. So mm -hmm. even if you get from minus five to minus four next year, you're going to see a nicer world than you are right now. So while you're going to invest a month and spend a little time, I'm biased, but I think it's super worth endmyopia.org. Love it. Endmyopia.org. And I would imagine that once you start to see the progress, it would be intoxicating. Oh, nobody be. stops. Oh my God. Yeah. No, because you, you, you want to go, no, like how far can I go? How far can I get there? So, yeah. 
I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jake. It's been such a pleasure to meet you. I hope uh, we get to talk again. And I hope that you're able to get your family safely out of danger. And, um, and that we get back to some semblance of normalcy in the not too distant future. I hope so too. And thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to leave us a five-star review on iTunes because that's what helps us to be heard and to be seen. If you'd like to connect with me directly, or if you'd like to leave any comments, or if you have any questions about this episode, please reach out to me directly through my website, natnidham.com. And of course, if you're not already a member of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Community on Facebook, that's where you'll find me every day. It's a short application. Just answer a couple of questions and you're in and interfacing with other amazing biohackers. Thanks again, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode.